allemaal, I'm Barbara Arnold and welcome to this week's episode of Tulip TV. I'm intrigued why flowers in Canada cost so much more than in the Netherlands. So I talked to the growers and to the auction house. And basically it's all a matter of cost comparison between Holland and Canada. The reasons flowers cost more in Canada is because it costs a lot more for the retailer here to get their space. In Holland, most of the flower stores are street vendors, so there's way less cost. There are many other reasons such as higher taxes in Canada and in the Netherlands, growers receive subsidies. So all in all, the Canadian consumer just will have to figure out where they can get the cheapest flowers. So look at the street vendors or your corner store. Now go out there and buy some flowers and be like a Dutch person. And here's what's coming up next. This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. So what is so different in life? between Vancouver and uh, living in Rotterdam? Well, you know, if, if you could see with your own eyes, but you know, there's a lot of people here on a small country, so it's very busy, it's very crowded, uh, quite a bit of traffic to get to work, although I'm lucky I don't live too much away from, from my office, but uh, yeah, it's more uh, hectic here, you know, the, the quality of life, you don't have to, I miss the mountains from Vancouver for sure, but as you will see a little bit later, we. Um, we go to work uh, near the ocean, so it's pretty cool uh, there as well. But uh, yeah, it is it is very very different. Um, I've been here many times, obviously, when I lived in Vancouver. But being back here and living here, it takes a while to get uh, used again to the uh, to the Dutch lifestyle. Yeah, I must weird. In a car driving to uh, the to the Maasvlakte, which is the uh, larger part of the, the port. The, uh, the first parts were built in the 50s, 60s, and lately they uh, they added a huge amount of land, uh, and building one of the most impressive uh, ports in the world, I think. Um, and as you know, that's currently I'm working for that port, so we're driving towards uh, the uh, the Maasvlakte, as we call it, and uh, hope to let you show. Uh, what the Dutch people are building over there. Okay, so first we uh, will drive to uh, to one of the container terminals that's opened uh, two years ago. And I actually started working on it almost a decade ago. And uh, you'll see fir firsthand pretty close by the, uh, the full automated terminal. Uh, and then we go back and I'll show you the, uh, the enormous addition that uh, the Dutch just added to, the, to this already big port. And there you'll see the, the, the two terminals that are being uh, built right now and are planned to open in 2014. So what we're looking uh, at is actually uh, the Euromax terminal. Uh, I helped uh, creating the IT, IT blueprint 10 years ago. But, and this terminal is almost completely robotized. Uh, there are still people on the cranes, but uh, the crane you see in the front who, uh, who pick up and store the containers uh, in the yard, they're all robotized. And on the water side there are so-called automated guided vehicles that bring the containers to and from the ship. And um, yeah, that's all uh, automated. Um, 
And to give you an example, for a terminal of this size in Vancouver, you would definitely see hundreds and hundreds of people um, moving those containers uh, at the port. The new terminals that are currently being built, they will have big energy cranes with uh, actually drivers, quote unquote, in the office. They're able to uh, control a few cranes, so there are no more people even on the cranes itself. And there's nobody on the ground. Well, the dikes are uh, very strong because you know it's one of the one of the things we do very well. And half of the country is reclaimed land. But just to give an example, where I live, uh, if there would be no dikes, my house would be completely gone and uh, probably three or four meters underwater. So. Uh, the floor of my house is, is, is so much below the water level that you actually don't think about it, but without the dikes, uh, yeah, I, uh, my house would be gone. It's amazing uh, how much land we reclaimed from the ocean by just building a couple of good dikes. So here we are at the uh, at the, um, the new part of, 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 of the port and if I would have taken you here three years ago you would have seen just ocean, just water. Uh, but it's pretty amazing after only uh, that amount of time how much sand has been uh, dredged up and you're looking at uh, a part of the new port. Yeah, so this picture actually shows the enormous amount of uh, land that has been reclaimed as well as the huge dike that has now been uh, built to uh, protect uh, the new port. And then uh, in front of uh, here you see uh, the two terminals that, that are being developed. The, uh, the other side of the of the big dike so here they created uh, really really nice beaches as you can see and it's uh, it's all ocean well I think uh, many years ago uh, Vancouver created with Delta port a similar kind of uh, port environment as we have in Rotterdam now with the expansion of the port, also Rotterdam went through a long process for getting environmental approvals. I know the Port Authority of Vancouver has plans to expand Delta Port, uh, maybe get another uh, terminal over there. Um, yeah, but looking at Richmond, I've walked that dike a few times. It's obviously uh, you know, an, a dangerous area when it comes to earthquakes uh, and tsunamis possibly. But it looks to me that uh, you know some some Dutch knowledge to uh, increase the, the the dikes in Richmond may be necessary in the future, especially with the sea level rising. Uh, but sure, something like this can be done to protect Richmond uh, as well. There's a lot of similarities between uh, a port like Vancouver and Rotterdam from a port authority perspective. Um, they're both forward thinking. I do believe maybe that in Rotterdam they're a little bit more aggressive in things getting done. Uh, there's been a lot of talks to expand Delta Port, but it takes a long time. And uh, Rotterdam is making the investment now, although the economy is not that great. But for sure with all the investments they've done in terms of creating land, creating a lot of distribution centers, so the uh, big container ships will come to Rotterdam. That's forward thinking that I think should be able to do, in, uh, people do in Vancouver as well. Uh, I know there are thoughts to create big distribution centers around Delta Port. And if they're successful in doing that, then it will attract more business and it will be good for the economy. Not only for BC, but the whole of uh, Canada. Because after all, it is the Pacific Gateway um, to Canada.
This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. I work for Amsterdam Marketing. Well, Amsterdam is quite special. It's not that large. It's not. We don't even have uh, one million inhabitants. Um, but it offers a, a huge variety of um, activities, things you can do. We have more museums per square kilometre than any other city of the world, and we're quite proud of that. And do think of a museum with modern art, art of the golden uh, age, uh, but also um, a museum uh, of bags and purses, for example. Oh, Amsterdam is quite old. Um, I think it's almost 800 years old, actually. But next year, um, it's not just Amsterdam we're celebrating, but it's many, many large icons in this city that happen to have a jubilee next year. Uh, it's going to be a marvelous year, very, very festive, and also for a, a broad variety of people. Um, the Ring of Canals is uh, 400 years old then, but also the uh, Rijksmuseum is going to open mid-April, we're very much looking forward to that. That's a beautiful large museum at the Museum Square with uh, amongst many many other pieces of art. There is uh, the famous Night Watch from Rembrandt. Um, and furthermore, uh, the zoo is 175 years old, uh, the Frans House Museum in Haarlem is 100 years old, uh, the Concertgebouw, beautiful building, and also its orchestra will celebrate its 125th anniversary. Um, there are many, many large events next year in Amsterdam and um, we will organize lots of festivities around the canals in order to share that with the people of Amsterdam and of course with the visitors. Amsterdam is known as, as the city of bicycles. Why is that so? Is it very much supported by the, by the city council? Or what, what do the uh, car owners say? The car owners uh, know that Amsterdam is just, it's not made for driving. I just told you it's a very old city and um, it's simply not possible to allow all the cars to get into town. Uh, once you've been here you realize that and you actually appreciate the fact that we do not promote cars in Amsterdam. There are a lot of parking arrangements around the city where you can go to, you, could, you drive there, you park your car there and then with public transport or with a bike um, you go to the central, uh, central city. Uh, we have um, about as many bicycles in town as we have uh, citizens. Where to park your, car, your bicycle, that is of course uh, always an issue. Uh, around the central station and also around other train stations. Uh, we have thought up many different solutions and we're now trying to find out which one works the best. Uh, are there any helmet laws here for bicycle riders? Oh, yeah, they should, yeah. Um, no, there are no helmet laws for bicycles. Now, very, very small kids, they tend to wear a helmet, uh, but here we simply don't do that. Also, when, when you use a, a bicycle for a sportive reason, yes, of course, then you wear a helmet. Uh, you know, the Tour de France, everybody wears a helmet, that's logical. But here in Amsterdam, um, hardly anybody wears a helmet, and it's, uh, we don't have a lot of accidents like that, no. I know about electric bicycles, we have them here. It's very nice for elderly people. Um, and yes, there is a tendency uh, uh, to buy them, uh, but that is more for elderly people or people who uh, cannot cycle themselves. canal tours of course for an hour or for an hour and a half or longer with the dinner uh, but we also have have uh, hop on hop off 
canal boats. Uh, they are very, very nice. Uh, for tourists, it's a very good way to learn the city a bit. And we also have pedal boats, um, and the tourists really like those. We're very, very glad to see that many of the canal boats are now electric. And uh, I would say when you come here to Amsterdam, make sure you get an electric boat, mm -hmm. because um, they don't make a lot of noise. Uh, that way you can hear the guide a lot better and most of all they are so much cleaner for the city so it's very important. A few years ago the, uh, the water in the canals was quite dirty um, and we have a system that we um, uh, can uh, uh, get the water to flow through the canals uh, at night in a, in a very fast way and then it, it goes back to the river and that way the water will clean will be cleaned um, that's a special system that we use and we actually see that the water is a lot lot cleaner than it was a few years ago and we even organize swim contests in the canals right now We'd very much like to welcome you in Amsterdam, of course. Uh, next year will be a great opportunity because it's going to be a very festive year. Um, for all the, 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 the calendars, have a look at www.iamsterdam.com slash 2013. Hope to see you then. Dag! This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. Canada to Leave is the online community for the Dutch living in Canada and the Canadians living in the Netherlands. Canada to Leave, wherever you live. <laughs> My name is Toby Barrett. I'm the director of the Snow School and Mountain Adventures Department here at Grouse Mountain. Um, I've been working here now for nine years and I can honestly say that I'm sort of living my dream getting to work on a mountain as beautiful as this one and be here year round and sharing all the fun of you know the skiing and snow sports in the winter time and then uh, our summer adventures that we have up here uh, during our green season. So, very lucky guy and very happy to, to be here uh, to share it with everybody. You can see all these statues too. These are part of a series that was done by an artist named Glenn Greensides. And each of them represent different pieces of British Columbia, but those ones in particular are representative of the wildlife that are around around us in this environment here. And up top here we have our grizzly bear habitat which we'll walk over to now and check that out. Two full full grown male grizzly bears and uh, they were brought to us as orphans. Um, so they were found very very young like in the springtime so they would have just been born and uh, only a few months old and their mothers had uh, either been killed or, or had disappeared for, for whatever reason. And so uh, that opportunity was given to us to create a habitat for these bears so that they could live out their life. And uh, so that's what we did. We created the wildlife refuge here at Grouse Mountain. And we now have this beautiful habitat for them just here on the plateau area of the mountain. Uh, and they, they live together and, uh, and enjoy life. So that building just there is the bear den. Uh, that's where Grinder and Kula spend the winter hibernating. So once uh, the weather starts to turn, those bears instinctually know uh, when it's time to start preparing themselves. They will go into their den and, and start building their, their beds and they're sort of making it comfortable for themselves for the winter, uh, as well as foraging around their habitat, trying to fatten up uh, and get those stores on for the winter time so that they can 
can lie in there and, and hibernate for the for the entire season. You know, a lot of people think hibernation is just this deep sleep, they don't move for the entire three months, but uh, or four months, but that's not the case. They do get up and stretch their legs and move around a little bit, um, just to stay, you know, stay limber and stay loose. Here is our Lumberjack Show Stadium. So three times daily we have a, a presentation, about a 40 minute presentation. Uh, and it really tells the story of BC's history. So the, the lumberjacks that came and began logging these areas, right here even Grouse Mountain was one of the original areas that was logged and really built the economy here in the lower mainland as well as the, the western part of Canada. Uh, right now we're on our peak chair, so this is our scenic chair ride that takes us to the very top of Grouse Mountain, which is about 1,200 meters above sea level. So this, uh, this chair though brings us through the forest here. We are in a Pacific temperate coastal rainforest and uh, you know again it's just what makes this place so special is being as close to the city as we are, but able to get into the wilderness like this and have the access that, that we have here at Grouse Mountain with our various lifts. When we are up there at the top, mm -hmm. we, we probably can see the city, right? You most definitely can see the city. Even uh, from about halfway up the chairlift here, when we look back, we can see the city. Um, once we get into the eye of the wind, um, that that viewpoint there or the observation deck or view pod really gives you the, the most breathtaking view in the lower mainland not only of the city below us but it allows you to see back into the the wilderness behind the mountains here um, which is something that I think even us locals that live here and were born and raised here take for granted is just how close um, to the backcountry and to the wilderness that we we are living in a large city like Vancouver During the Olympic period here at Grouse Mountain, we were kind of like an unofficial party venue. We, we had lots of different activities going on uh, based on the Olympic, uh, Olympic events that were happening. Uh, youth hockey tournaments on our ice pond, um, as well as we stayed open for skiing and snowboarding activities 24 hours a day for the entire two weeks. So we would have people coming and skiing or going snowshoeing and doing different activities like that, going zip lining even. Um, so it was really a lot of fun and opened it up to all the volunteers and athletes as well. And I think what I kind of took from that whole experience was just the, the sense of community that exists around sport, uh, you know, and how easily it breaks down barriers and how, how much pride everybody takes in their, in their country and in their home. And especially here in Canada, when I had the opportunity to go down into the city uh, and walk around Granville Street and Robson Street, it was really remarkable how patriotic Canadians became during that time. And I really feel that that, uh, you know, even sort of found itself in, in me and is something that I've carried for, forward, uh, you know, to this day. This program is sponsored by Dutch, the full-color English language magazine about the Netherlands and its people, at home and abroad. We hope you liked our program today. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and please tell your friends about us and your family. We solely rely on viewers like you, so if you would like to sponsor us, please go to our website www.tuliptv.com 
and click on donate. On behalf of everybody here at Tulip TV, we'd like to thank you for watching us today and we'll see you again next week. Tot volgende week!